Okay, we are recording. And, oh wait, people are coming in. I'm gonna promote Christine. Pam is also in the in the audience. Is she okay? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you. Okay. It should be good. I don't see Christine yet. She said she's going to be doing it by her phone. And so I wonder if we're not going to see her because she's by phone. Christine, by any chance, can you Three, four, hear us five. and speak? He's not in the room. Okay. Well, I believe two, three, four, five. I believe we have a quorum. So I'm gonna start the I'm gonna start the meeting and hope Christine joins. So oh, welcome everybody to this afternoon's meeting of the Jones uh, Library Building Committee. Um we are joined by some colleagues from FAA. Thank you for Thank you for coming. Uh, if you would si signify your attendance by saying you're here, uh, Farah. Here. Melissa. Here. George. Here. Uh, Sharon. Here. Pam. I'm here. And I'm Austin Sarrett. So welcome everybody. The first order of business is to welcome Melissa Zwicky to our committee. Thank you, Melissa, for uh, for joining us. We really look forward to working with you um, as we go forward with the with the project. So, thank you, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Uh, we have uh, item two on the agenda is the approval of minutes, but we actually have no minutes to approve. Um, item three is a report from the town manager, but we have no town manager to make the report. So. Um, item four is a report from our OPM. I wanted to just give everybody a heads up. As a result of our conversation at the last Jones Library Building Committee, in particular, uh, very acute, very helpful comments made by Councillor Rooney, um, I've asked FAA to meet with us tonight to present their plan, the work that they're doing, and to include in that plan the historic mill work. So we had talked about taking it out of the library. Uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is actually putting it back into the plant. Okay, Bob Perrin. Yes, good afternoon, or good evening, I guess it is technically. Um, as it's noted on the agenda, I'm here to discuss a couple of things, um, outstanding invoices, as well as giving an overall project update. Uh, regarding outstanding invoices, we have two invoices in front of us this evening, um, and I guess I could share my screen if that would be helpful. Sure, please do. Sharon, can you, your disabled participant screen sharing is the message I'm getting. Try that, Bob. Okay, uh, yes, now I need to actually get a screen that I can share, but you're going to momentarily see a screen that has nothing to do with what we're talking about right now. Um, you you sh should be able to see the agenda, I believe now, Yep. Um, as well as two invoices that are attached to it. Um, let me, I'm just trying to get them to a size that it makes. Okay, so hopefully these are somewhat readable to folks. If there's any can, questions, certainly you, feel free. Can you, can you enlarge them? 
I'll go even further. Okay, sure. So the first invoice is actually an old invoice from Collier's. Uh, dates back, the invoice date is April 30th, and that was her services provided during the month of April of April of 24. Um, that was when we were in the bidding phase for the first um, uh, time of bidding this project. Uh, Collier's had a monthly, a contractual monthly uh, billing rate of $10,978, and that's what the amount of this invoice is. And my recommendation, since it's work that was under contract, um, it was not a contract modification or, or expansion, is that we um, authorize payment of this invoice for services that were provided several months ago. All right. Thank you, Bob. Uh, first of all, Pam, before I, before I call on you, um, if somebody could move the approval of this invoice, let's do it invoice by invoice. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Pam Rooney. Thank you. Um, in looking at this invoice, um, and I recognize that it was work, it was in the past, but because it was in February and April, um, it looks like it falls under the budget for um, construction services as opposed to design and bidding phase, which says to me that there has been about or with this uh, with this invoice. Colliers would have billed roughly $67,000 into their construction administration budget. Um, and it, it seems to me that if they were already moving into the construction budget, that they should have requested a scope, a change of scope um, and to expand the services for the bid phase since it was extended several times um, and several months, in fact, by the architects. And I would I would not prefer to pay for services that we shouldn't be billed for at this point. We should not be paying for construction services um, when that hasn't happened. Thank you. Bob, can you give a little bit more of an explanation, please? Certainly. Um, and 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 uh, Pam is correct in that in terms of the the numbers that she mentioned here, what the decision that was made and was discussed with the town manager, at the time when the project ran late, uh, there was an anticipated uh, bidding date, I believe originally it might have been January or February of 2024, uh, as a result of a number of different things, plumbing code changes, other types of things that required us to continue to extend the bidding period. Colliers continue to provide bidding phase services. They, quite honestly, it came back to us at one point and were looking for a, a basically to start billing us at the rate for construction phase services, which was, I believe, in excess of $30,000 per month. We said, no, uh, we won't accept that, but we will accept you continuing to bill us at the agreed upon rate for bidding phase services, um, as long as that we were still in the bidding phase um, stage of the project. We agreed that we weren't going to increase their contract value at that point because it was speculative to really understand, you know, where the project was going at that point. So we we did um, authorize them to continue billing at the bidding, bidding phase rate, but we uh, did not increase their total contract value at that point. So their total contract value remained what it had been. The, the invoice refers to construction, Bob. That's what oh. I think the, the question is. So if you look on the second line, it indicates $10,978 from February to April, and it's labeled construction. Right. They that Their position was that we had entered the construction phase. Um, we hadn't, obviously, and we wouldn't accept the billing at a much higher rate. Uh, the, uh, as I said, I, the construction phase contractual number was in excess of thirty thousand dollars per month. So we, because of the shift in time, our negotiated settlement was the the ten thousand nine seventy eight. I agree, it's confusing the way the invoice is presented, but I can say that that number is the dollar per month for bidding phase services that the town had agreed to a year and a half prior to this invoice as part of Collier's contract. So, the, so what's, la what's labeled construction is really not for construction. 
it's an extension of the bidding phase, uh, okay. but effectively um, coming out of what was allocated for the construction budget. Okay, Pam. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was not on the on the committee during most of the bid phase, and and is the ten thousand nine the actual rate that was established for bid phase services, or was it less than that? I mean, I could I could go back and look at you know October's. Yeah. The Collier's contract that predates me as well. Um, had a contract billing rate per month for uh, design and bidding phase services of ten thousand nine seventy eight. Um, there, they had a, actually billed us at a lower rate than that for a period of time. I'm trying to think if you could see that, or I thought it showed up here, but it. No, I don't see because they actually had overbilled us for some of the early months, as I understand, back in twenty twenty three. For a period of time, they were making a correction and billing at a lower rate than the 10,978. But the 10,978 is the design to bidding phase service monthly agreed upon contractual rate. Okay. Any other questions about the invoice? I want to wait because Pam was disconnected. Pam, are you back? I think so. Okay. Um, I I missed some of that. I just I I last heard that Bob was also not part of the committee at that point. Um, that there was some lower rate that was being billed. Um, what I had explained was that for several months, Collier's uh, was billing us at a lower rate. I believe it was seven thousand high range of seven thousand dollars because they had acknowledged that they had overbilled us early in the project. And they were making corrections in their um, monthly billing to adjust for that overbilling. Uh, but at this point, they had, they had satisfied that basically correction of the overbilling. And the 10978 is what the contract specifies for uh, the cost of monthly services. Thank you. Okay, any other questions about this invoice? Okay, and the question of approval of the invoice, Sharon. Yes. Farah? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Uh, George? Yes. Uh, Pam? No. And Austin votes yes. Okay, Bob. What's next? The second invoice that we have tonight is an invoice from Feingold Alexander Architects. This is the first invoice that is received under their new contract, which the Jones Library will reimburse the town of Amherst uh, for the cost of. So this is a bill to the town of Amherst, but it will be, uh, as I said, reimbursed um, by, by the library back to the town. Um, and it's 25% of their their fee for the redesigned services, which appears reasonable based on the, the work that they've done to date. Okay. Um, a motion to approve the invoice? So moved. A second? Second. Okay. Uh, any questions about this invoice? Pam. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, when was the when was the contract extended by the town manager? Do you does anyone remember the date? I don't have that information handy. Um, so it was I just, in the month so of just, June. I know. I don't know uh, what the date in of the month of, in in during the month of June would be. But it it appears that it was that it was roughly the beginning of June till the end, and this covers invoices from beginning of June. So our our new the new contract was in place at that point, or the extension of the contract was in place. It was in place uh, during this time period uh, that the invoice covers. It may not have been in place at the beginning of that time period, uh, as 
the town and Jones Library were working out the MOA and some other items. Um, okay. Any other questions about the invoice? Okay, on the question of approving this invoice, Sharon? Yes. Farah? Yes. George? Yes. Uh, Councillor Rooney, Pam? Yes. Christine? Yes. Thank you. Have I gotten everybody? And Austin votes yes. Okay, Bob? If you'd like, then I can move on to a quick update of where the project stands. Uh, Great. That would be fabulous. For the time being, and then obviously FAA will be speaking regarding the design yep. issues. Um, the project was posted for the pre-qualification phase of, of the bidding process today. It, it officially hit the street. Uh, contractors have a deadline of August 7th to submit the required pre-qualification information. <laughs> which we will then review and come up with a list of pre-qualified contractors. Uh, once that list is put together, we are still working on the schedule of then releasing the actual bid package uh, on or about September 11th to the contractors that have been pre-qualified at that point. Great. Okay, any questions for Bob? Bob, on the agenda, it says permitting. Are you going to say anything yes. about permitting? Certainly. I can talk about where we stand there, again, right. uh, mainly Please from do. a schedule standpoint and, and what's ahead of us. Right. Uh, our first permitting uh, meeting will be coming up with the Design Review Board. It's coming up on July 22nd, uh, and we've been working with FAA and the library to get ready for that meeting. Following that uh, will be a meeting with the Planning Board on July 31st, and then the next evening will be a meeting with the Historical Commission on August 1st. Um, did want to note that we did receive today a signed site permit application from the Amherst Historical Society. Uh, uh, committee members may remember that we have to seek a site plan approval for the retaining wall that's being constructed. Uh, mostly on Jones Library property, but the backside of the retaining wall, the backside of the footing of the retaining wall extends on to um, Amherst Historical Society property. And therefore we have to submit a separate site plan review application. And as property owner, uh, they needed to sign the application and they have, and it's now been submitted to the uh, planning department in Amherst uh, to process that. It won't be heard most likely at the same night as the mm -hmm. overall library project, but it'll be heard uh, most likely a week or two later. Thank and you. if you thunder has hit us in East Hampton right now, so it's coming away. I don't know if you can hear the sounds <laughs> in the background. We're waiting for Melissa to take care of it, but short of <laughs> that, we'll, we'll endure. Well, thank you, Bob. Any questions for Bob? Okay. Uh, so, Austin, oh, I have a far, question. Yeah. Um, Bob, so you said the package will be released September 11th. Is that correct? That's our target deadline. Yes. Okay. Um, so, and then what? What is what is the the timeline? Is it three months? No, like, it's a shorter timetable than that. If I go back, I don't the packet. This week's packet didn't include the um, the overall bar chart schedule that I put together, but I have that in front of me. We were anticipating, because it's likewise a two-step process where you receive bids from certain types of subcontractors first, mm -hmm. and then the general contractors incorporate that bidding information into their overall general bid. We were anticipating releasing September 11th and then ultimately having the general bids due during the week of October 21st, so about a six-week period, five to okay. six-week period there. Okay. Thank you. And Bob, you will be working with potential um, bidders uh, to as the process unfolds. Is that correct? Uh, certainly in terms of getting the word out to them, making yeah. certain they're aware of the project. And that's already started. Yesterday, I released to all of the contractors who would be pre-qualified both 
subcontractors, plumbers, electricians, et cetera, as well as general contractors. I sent them all a notice that this was going to be released as of today. So they, you know, so they had advance warning that it was coming. And then you right. know, if I don't see uh, interest from prospective bidders, because I can see who actually downloads the documents online, you know, I'll make certain that I reach out to those that I know have been interested previously to see if there's any reason, you know, why they they haven't um, have it downloaded the documents and started looking at them. Okay, thank you, Bob. Thanks for the work that you're doing. So uh, we now the next item is to hear from our um, architects. So I don't know, Josephine, Tony, who is gonna? Uh, it's, um, hi, everyone. Um... I'm going to just uh, give a presentation of what we are going to share with you about the design. In particular, we have a series of, of images that compare the some of the original rendering views that we showed previously, and then currently as a result of the um, price reduction exercise. So I'm going to screen share and then lead you through it. And then uh, Josephine, of course, um, and Dan as well can be there if there are particularly detailed questions that might arise. So I'm going to go ahead and screen share, right? Can we also have our colleagues at Berkshire Design Group, Rachel and Jess? I'm sure you, you see them, but um, they will be speaking to the landscape and they will talk about some of their changes as well right after we go through the architectural changes. Great. Thanks, Josephine. Mm -hmm. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, so what we've set up is a series of views uh, that are gonna demonstrate some of the evolving design changes. Right. So on the left, this is gonna be starting with the first floor level, which we of course have previously called, oops, something went bad. <laughs> Try again. So Josephine, there may be some issue can you pull up the project images? Sure. One second. Oh, we have more than one of us here. <laughs> My internet connection, I don't know if it's a storm or what. Somebody calls it to stop. It's getting dark. <laughs> yeah. Can everyone see that? Great. Yep. Thank you. So, um, what we're going to start to show you is a number of images. I think, Justin, is this the first one or there may be one before this, right? There's one before. <laughs> okay, here we go. So starting with the first level um, down at the, at the you know, ground floor, what we're seeing here on the left was the original rendering from the original design. And on the right, these, of course, are much more uh, simplified without all the fancy rendering people and materials and, and such. But I'm going to point out the key differences that you're seeing here. So the main area here, the primary change, of course, is the structure change. So when we eliminated the cross laminated timber construction, which includes the elements, which are the wood columns and the wood beams that you can clearly see on the left, we've been able to restructure it. And actually, we have now been able to eliminate the need for those columnar supports because we're going to more conventional steel construction. So that is one major change that you're seeing comparing the left to the right. The other big change uh, that we're showing here is the ceiling treatment itself. Um, previously, we had a series of these um, vertical acoustic blades, which are rendered in white uh, that you can see sort of in between each of the wood beams. And now what we're going back to is a product, which we call the Rulon product. It's an acoustical ceiling product. We later will have some images of the actual product samples for you to see. But this, this also simplifies greatly the acoustic treatment. So it still achieves the acoustic um, a treatment that we need for this level, but in a much simpler and more cost-effective way. Um, there are a number of things here, which we are not all showing uh, the development of the ductwork and things of like that. Um, is still in play and will exist. And we're not showing lighting and any other things that you see in the renderings. But I would say those are the biggest changes. And then we'll talk a little bit later about the stair too, which we're simplifying the details around the main public circulation stair that you see here. But this, the, this is the really the big um, areas that we're impacting 
on this level as a result of the change in the design. And I'm going to leave this here for a minute to leave it open to questions, and then we'll continue going through the rest of the spaces. But I'm going to let people absorb this. OK, any any questions about anything that you're seeing? OK, Tony. So we'll go to the next image then, and we can always come back to this if there are questions. OK, now coming up to the main um, adult nonfiction reading area in the new wing. This is level two. Again, the left shows the original design. The right shows the revised design. Uh, and again, the main differential also is evident here. So the cross laminated timber wood beams and columns um, have been eliminated. Uh, in place of that is now steel frame construction. And as a result of going to the steel frame, we actually have eliminated the need for the number of these vertical supports. So it's actually in some ways opening up the plan mm -hmm. because the columns go away due to the change in construction. Uh, I will also point out again, the same issue about the acoustic treatment with those vertical white blades that are suspended on the left have been replaced with this Rulon acoustic sling product on the right. And then the other uh, significant change, of course, is that the light monitor, uh, which you can see in the rendering on the left over the sort of central reading area, that has been eliminated. Um, and now the ceiling just extends across the whole space. Um, so that is uh, another significant uh, change. And then finally, with respect to the railing uh, details and all of that, so we are simplifying the stair treatment and details around the railing. As you can see, it's much more simplified as a kind of vertical picket railing system that extends around the stair. And then the stair itself, we're also simplifying the way that the whole materials around the stair tread, the stair riser, all of that is being made in a much more efficient, economical way around the stair case itself. So those four uh, areas are the primary changes between the original design on the left and the proposed redesign on the right. And again, acoustic issue, we're not showing the ductwork, we're not showing the lighting elements, those will all still be there, but we just wanted to make the big moves apparent. So, right, and just, Tony, just, just I'm sorry, just to be clear, the, the risers on the stairs. Previously, we had this idea of this open Yep. not open, but a sort of a, a mesh steel risers vertically sort of penetrating light through that is gone. Um, so we're going to a much simpler solid stair treatment. Um, and, I, and I don't know, Josephine or Dan, if you want to just elaborate a little bit on the stair itself. I think we're still researching products for the stair, but we're thinking okay. of a um, tile for the tread rather than wood, since we don't have wood you know, okay. in the building now any longer. So just thinking of materials in a different way. Great, thanks. Okay, questions about what you're seeing in front of you now. Pam. Uh, so the, the light monitor, is that essentially a um, a skylight? So the skylight is gone? It was a clear story, Pam. Um, uh, we didn't want to do a skylight. Um, so clear story is, uh, you know, vertical windows um, sort of aligning the edge with the ceiling. Uh, that was all um, taken out due to budget. And will that affect the uh, the profile of the building as viewed from the exterior? It is. There there was some very small areas where the light monitor was visible before. Um, and we are going to share, the landscape architect is going to share the design, which included some updated renderings on the exterior. Um, so it's very small, modest, but uh, yes, those visible areas for the monitor is no longer visible, obviously, because it's no longer there. Thank you. Okay, Tony. Great. Right. All right, let's go to the next pair of images. So these images, actually, we never did professional renderings, but we just wanted to share mm -hmm. with some of the other spaces um, that we've been in the course evolving. So the left-hand side, again, on the garden level, the ground level, is the meeting space. Um, and then on the right side is, again, on the on level one, is the children's area. So again, I'm gonna point out the main things just to be aware of in the development of these spaces. So in the meeting room space, again, we are uh, eliminating previously the 
the CLT construction with, with resulting in the steel uh, framing, we eliminated, there used to be some columns running in the space, the meeting space, those have gone. So the meeting space in some ways doesn't have com columns encumbering the space itself as a result of that. And we are trying to explore ways to try to maximize the ceiling height as much as we can. There are going to be a series of drop uh, soffit beam area enclosures, like you can see in the rendering sort of running across the space. Uh, but then we're going to here in between the beams, try to raise the ceiling, keep it as high as we can, introduce again the acoustic, simple acoustic treatment in between the sort of uh, horizontal members there. Uh, the mechanical system will be exposed. That's always been the case uh, in terms of the ductwork. Again, we're not showing lighting fixture elements, but those will come. So this, this is a view which you have not seen before, but this is what is going on with the meeting space. And to the right on the children's uh, ceiling area, Previously, we had um, a sort of a lot of acoustic suspended clouds running across the entire ceiling. Um, so we've had to eliminate a great number of those uh, due to cost issues. But again, we've been able to substitute back a more conventional acoustic ceiling um, in the grid pattern. Uh, but we did still maintain some cloud areas in some parts of the children li library, which has some more playful feature elements, we did want to try to introduce some scale breaks in the ceiling plane. So those are, again, some of the major changes. And then again, we're trying to simplify the overall design and ha have the ability to see the space as open as we can within the children's library. So some of those things are primarily developmental issues, but again, we're sharing with you um, spaces that you had actually not seen before. Okay, Pam. I have a question on the children's area. What I'm seeing on the right appears to be a service desk, um, but it is does not appear to be handicapped accessible, uh, and especially handicapped accessible by uh, a child in a wheelchair. And I wonder if, if I'm seeing it incorrectly. Very good question, Pam. There is in the CERC desk, this reference desk area, a sort of lower section uh, that is addressing uh, accessibility with respect to a child, however, in a wheelchair, uh, that is a very good question, um, which we have to get back to you on. But at the moment, this does address at least vis-a-vis -vis, um, an adult, um, uh, but we'll have to come back to you on that question and, and get more focus on that for you. Just didn't appear to be any knee room, even for an adult in a wheelchair. Yep. This again, the, the, the development of the desk uh, reference area is still evolving as we're also looking at these pieces too. Um, but your point is very well taken and we will be sure to focus in on that to make sure it addresses uh, accessibility for all. Great, any other questions about these spaces as they're rendered? Okay. Okay, and then the next, I think image, this is just uh, showing you the product that is being proposed in the ceiling. Here. So this is a kind of linear plank ceiling system. So essentially it has the appearance of looking like a series of uh, horizontal planks running across the space that you can see in the kind of upper left image. But above that is acoustic uh, treatment so that it does filter and batten the acoustic uh, behind these sort of uh, horizontal suspended panel systems. Uh, and then on the right, this is just a more elaborated space that shows how the ceiling can even be shaped in different geometries. Uh, to kind of ignore the color for the moment. That's, again, just the product literature. But this is how the actual uh, linear plank acoustic ceiling will be working in these spaces. The the image on the left with the uh, with the hanging part, that's what you're, what you're proposing? No, actually, the ceiling will be mounted much flusher to the ceiling underside. That, that's just showing how the product actually in this space okay. is just floated. But that is not what okay. we're doing. Great. Okay, other questions about this? Yep, Pam. Can someone describe where this this particular ceiling would be um, would be seen? Sure. If we go back, Josephine, to the previous rendering, um, one before that here. So every area that you see sort of tan, brown color, Pam, that is where this product mm -hmm. is going to go. Thank you. So when you say acoustical tile, you're not talking about what we've seen for the last decades with the, the white perforated square, two by two squares. No, although again, 
we're 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 getting into much more refinement. But for example, in this view here, you see the area that's more white, which Josephine is highlighting there. <clears throat> that is going to be a more conventional um, acoustic plank system. But um, it we're 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 trying to minimize where we have the two by twos um, because we we know that that is has a certain aesthetic associated with it. But that is the more conventional acoustic white ceiling tile versus this more linear plank system in the brown. Thank you. Okay, any other questions about the ceiling? All right, Tony. I think that basically brings up to speed uh, the design evolution in these spaces. Okay, and do you want to just, uh, you or Josephine, just say a word about um, the historic mill work? Or you want me to jump on that one, Tony? Yes, please. Right, so um, with the new news of Mad Millwork um, staying in, um, this week we've been consulting with a few different experts in the field to try to get a handle on um, uh, what to do with the uh, the plaster and the best approach. And so um, it's seeming like the best, most cost-effective approach is not to remove um, the plaster at all. And so we'll be now strategizing on how to keep the penetrations in the existing building um, to a minimum. And um, we'd be doing that by selecting sections of areas um, to run our systems. And um, and then we'd be patching in place in, in these swaths of area where we can run the system. So we'll be keeping it at a minimum and there will be a lot of strategizing going on and, and, um, and coordination, but um, we're hearing that this is the best approach and most cost effective. Um, so that's th this week. That's what we're sort of researching and, and wrapping our heads around. Yeah, I know that it's not finalized, Joseph, but I'm not sure I understood what you said. So could you could you just say it again? And sure. Yeah. Um, so as far as removing any plaster that was yep. that you know has asbestos, there's um, a lot of that in the building, right? Um, and so the original discussion was cutting around all of the millwork to remove that, right? Yep. Now the thought is to not do that and to retain that plaster along with the millwork. Oh. So things would pretty much be staying as it is. Uh -huh. And um, the areas where we need to cut into it for our new systems, you know, electrical wiring, fire um, sprinklers, um, we'd be looking for locations. Um, we'd be trying to gather everything in, in in one location in each space, right? So we'd be looking at like swaps, maybe vertical swaps or, mm -hmm. you know, along the floor. Um, and so keeping it at a minimum, running everything along those, along that path and then patching in that location. So you really won't see much of a difference when you go back in, in the space because we'll be patching to manage basically. Um, is, uh, there a, is there any reason to be concerned that the plaster is itself I mean, is the plaster in good enough shape it's going to be fine for another 50 years? Yeah, I mean, I think our approach would be that we would go back in and paint, you know, okay. um, but if there were areas that probably should be um, looked at, we'll definitely look at them in the process. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Other questions? Yeah, Farah. Um, so Josephine, um, so does this mean that you're not going to take big sections and because from what, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I'd heard was that you'd have, be taking sections of the millwork clean and getting rid of the asbestos, then storing it somewhere and then bringing it back in. So you saying this is a different process, which yeah. is more cost effective. Yeah, and yeah. What would that and what what would how would that compare in terms of cost? Um, so we're talking to some professionals in the field. We don't have numbers, but from what they they've done this before, and mm -hmm. um and they're saying that the best approach is to leave it in place because there'll be there will be damage along the way if we remove it and store it, and um and they think that a it's going to be a lot 
extra costs, a lot of extra costs, but then also there will be damage along the way as well. And so um, they think it's it's a much better process to leave it in place if that's the intent is to keep it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Cara, are you good? Okay, FAA. Anything else? Oh, Pam. Sorry, I had I had a last question about the the plaster, and I know um, one of the drawings says demolish, remove uh, the ceiling. I think especially in the large reading room, um, but originally it was showing protecting the plaster cornices. Is that still the intent that that um, that that we wouldn't need to demolish the ceiling? We wouldn't need to touch those plaster cornices if we go this way. That's that's correct. We won't be touching the plaster cornices. Cool. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions on what we've seen so far? All right. So FAA, what's next? You know, we can turn to landscape, and I think Rachel's team is going to walk you through the changes in the site and on the exterior. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. It's nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks, Tony. Um, and Jess, Jess is here, too, in case things get a little funny. I'm on vacation, so <laughs> things are a little hobbled together. Yeah. Um, okay. everyone see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So we've been we've been working with FAA and the library to see where where we can squeeze some items out to help save some money, um, but still have a a quality landscape design that functions well. Um, so we're gonna walk you through um, what we've what we've figured out for this um, rebidding. So starting in the in the front. Of the, of the library before we had two Goshen stone benches at the front, like flanking every entry. Um, and th those have been removed. Those could be added later at a, diff at a later point if needed, um, but that that is going to provide some savings. Um, we've also removed the children's patio area. Um, we're retaining the shrubs in this area, um, but we're moving the landscaping to the west um, the children's seating, and um, we're going to be having to provide an emergency egress walkway, which we'll show you in the plans. Those are the changes at the front of the library. Um, then in the back, in the rain garden area, we were able to modify the stormwater design significantly in the front and back, and I'll walk you through that in detail. But the result is we've been able to eliminate the bridges um, and regrades. So instead of before we had the rain garden itself was one bowl that you walked over over bridges to connect to the parking lot and to the north entry. Now we will have three separate depressions. So three little baby bowls in the area that are connected by piping. Um, so what that does is that allows us to get rid of the bridges, which is savings. Um, you'll see in our later plans too, we've expanded the subsurface stormwater system in the back, which has allowed us to remove it in the front. We used to have two, so now we only have one. Um, and then we have some modifications to the utilities in the fire station alley. Uh, we will be we will be providing sewer and drainage lines with the project, but we're just not going to take on all of the all of the utilities in the fire station. Um, so that's the overview. Okay, great. So just pause. Any questions about this so far? So you're confident that the removal at the front, you'll still be able to uh, handle the runoff drainage um, adequately? Yes, our civil engineer has um, has gone through quite a process going through trying different tweaks to get the stormwater model to balance. So we are we are balancing pre pre construction flows with our post construction flows so we're going to be able to keep balance and match the 100 year storm event for our area 
um, with this construction and these changes. Okay, uh, Pam. Uh, thank you. So, did that did that require a lot of uh, redesign of your roof drains um, and downspouts, or um, how how did you? I mean, it's too bad that wasn't designed that way to begin with, uh, rather than having to have two separate storage bases. But um, is it going to affect um, uh, the yeah. roof runoff? No, great question. I could jump into the detail if that. Do you want me to share those? Or do you just want the big, big picture idea? Big, okay. Oh. Uh, um, yeah, so we are looking at anytime we increase impervious surface, so that's anything like roofs or additional paving, we have to make up the difference with storage on site of that volume of water that comes through. Um, when we looked at the site originally, we saw that we were adding quite a bit to the back of the site. Um, and we also had downspouts that released water onto the front of the building. So we were looking at, we were just assuming that the back would not have the, that we might be challenged with capacity of storage. So we split the drainage for the building front and back in the original design. So we took any of the downspouts in the front of the building and we had a subsurface storage system here underneath the lawn that eventually made its way through piping out into this municipal way, uh, municipal piping to North Pleasant. Um, and then everything on the back of the building, we were taking to the back um, and, and dealing with subsurface there, storage there. So anything new would have the subsurface system in the back and the rain garden volume. Everything um, of the existing in the front would go to this front subsurface system. Together, those did just barely get us to meet the 100-year storm uh, volume storage, but what our civil engineer was able to do was he in, he added another row of subsurface structures to the system, so making it a little bit bigger. And then he actually regraded this area and carved out more volume in the back. So those two changes combined allowed us to eliminate this. What that means um, for rerouting the roof drainage is um, the downspouts are in the same location they now they go into the ground to pipes below grade, um, which slope at 1% back to this system where that everything is gathered um, into the municipal, the, to the new drain pipe that goes out to North Pleasant. So it's a little bit of gymnastics and we were just, he kept tweaking things a little bit like, what if I just add one more and, and that was enough to get it to balance. Okay. Any other questions on this slide? Okay. Um, I'll walk you through the renderings, some images of this, and Great. Josephine, Tony, feel free to chime in to some things that we see. So this is um, what you saw last when we last met of what the exterior of the library would look like and landscaping building improvements combined. Um, out front, we, you know, you could just, you could barely see the children's area behind here and the stone benches that people were sitting on. Um, we had some red oak leaf hydrangeas, which we swept out with a different, different color. And then Tony and Josephine, do you want to talk about the building while we're on this slide? Yeah, I think the main, sorry, just what? Well. I'm going to give the overview. The main difference is that it's it's very modest. Um, the areas that the building looks like very similar to what you're seeing here in the renderings. Um, we're, when we get into more details about the windows and roof and other things, that gets more into the very specific material and other things. But yeah, and just to add, I don't think from this angle you were able to see the roof monitor. Um, to your, I think that's where you're pointing, Rachel. But um, okay. there's really no change architecturally here on this, on okay. this perspective, I, I believe. And if you could, it was just a, a smidge, but I don't think you could from this angle. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So then, this is the rendering, updated rendering, of the same similar view. Um, we've swapped it out. We swapped the oak leaf hydrangea with another oak leaf hydrangea that's purple, so it's more tonally. Um, compatible with the purples and whites in the front. Um, you can see now that the the benches are removed. 
And I think that's the extent of the changes in the landscape from this view. Could you just, in, uh, is it possible to enlarge the zoom a little bit yeah. so we can, we can actually get a little bit of a closer view of what good. Now, you just, could you go a little bit to the left? There you go. Okay, it shows people sitting on a, that's that's a wall, I take it. That they're yeah. Sitting on. Okay. yeah, the, the wall that we're, we're keeping at the front, yeah. Great. And we still have, we still have our accessible walkway on both sides and we still have our steps down the front, yeah. Yep. Okay, any questions about this? Go on to the next slide. Just the the previous previous view that we had of the view um, on the southwest side of the building. And we we like to highlight too that we are not proposing to limb up limb up, limb up the spruce here. Um, this is the renderer's artistic and interpretation so they can see the building. Um, but in this rendering from the from from the site view, the biggest changes were again, we had those cushion stone benches and then we had the children's area with a fence inside of it. Um, and we've we've eliminated the children's area now. Is there anything from the building side we'd see, Josephine and Tony? No. Yeah, this is largely the way it was originally designed, and so it looked very similar. Okay. Could you just uh, remind me? There's something that looks like a a tower on the roof. There, go up a little bit. That's it. What is that? That's a roof ladder that we're. I don't think we're supposed to be seeing, but it's currently a roof ladder that goes up to that top roof. That's uh -huh. what that. Right okay. near the chimney. Is that what okay. you're... Yeah, I don't think it's going to be nearly that visible. Yeah. But it's done. <laughs> it's not going to be quite that. Okay. Again, artistic license on roof ladders. All right. I just wanted <laughs> to make sure. Um, this is the updated view of that same corner of the building. You can see that we've eliminated the Goshen Stone bench, mm -hmm. the fence, um, and, and the ladder is gone. But um, yeah. our, <laughs> we, we did request the renderer uh, show the tree more realistic yep. to what it is today. Yep. So, so that's that's change. Okay. Um, this is the view from the Historical Society property. So all these shrubs are the existing shrubs on the Historical Society property that would remain. This is the existing Historical Society fence. You can see our new guard, our new guardrail, and new new wall that's in the mid-ground, so, so to speak. Um, what we had before is we had this very large Goshen stone seat wall at the back as, as a way to frame and um, separate the the seating work area from the rain garden area, mm -hmm. and that has been eliminated. Is there anything on the building, Josephine and Tony, that you want to talk us through? Here. So yeah. here you do see the monitor that you're going to see in the next view has been eliminated, mm -hmm. which can highlight right there. Yeah. Okay. And then the, this is oh, this is the update the updated view where we've gotten rid of that that Goshen stone bench. It could be laid, added later at another time, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and we've updated some of the planting, which we'll talk about in the next slide. And you can see the changes here. Okay, any questions about this view? All right. This is the view of the north entry to the guard, to the library. So we are standing in the CVS parking lot looking towards the library, mm -hmm. as I mentioned before. Um, we did have a different, slightly different grading and, and drainage system um, where we had a low, a low amorphous shape, which is like a bowl in the middle, um, that then we had little bridge crossings with um, 
curb railings on, some lighting integrated, and lots of different bands of planting that were subtle. Um, we have, we also had a, a retaining wall with um, reclaimed granite as a veneer. Um, and we had that, that Goshen stone bench in the back. Um, this is the, the updated view. Um, you can see that coming from the CVS parking lot, we've eliminated these those bridges. Um, we now just have a continuous concrete sidewalk up till where we meet the plaza. In addition, we've regraded um, and graded this area. We've retained the stepping stones. We're reusing the Goshen on site as stepping stones for garden areas mm -hmm. um, with some seeding boulders and reclaimed granite branch from the site. Um, you can see that we've eliminated that Goshen stone bench over here. Yeah. We've eliminated some of the patio furniture also that the library can can um, bring back in as, as they are able. Um, and we've eliminated the granite veneer and are gonna use a concrete color add mix uh, to the concrete on the wall. Um, at a later date, if if the library would want to put a mural, you know, work with the, the arts commission, um, mm -hmm. a mural could be applied, but um, there's some substantial savings there. And again, the monitor is not visible anymore. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Pam. Could there be someone that explains the, it looks like wrought iron fencing to the right of this entryway. It's it's on the top of the hill. Um, that looks like it's on historic property rather than on the library property. What And what is the purpose of that fencing? That's an existing fence that's part of the Historical Society property. I'm not entirely sure what the purpose is um, per se, but um, the the intent is to leave it there. Um, Thank you. It, it'd be nicer if it wasn't, but yeah. Okay. What you got next? Okay. Um, I'd like to walk you through walk you through just the, the plan set that we we're going to be um, presenting um, to the various boards and committees. Um, so this is the hard line black and white set that we'll be submitting. Mm -hmm. So we have our existing condition survey, which will have no changes. Um, we have our logistics plan, which will be the same as what was presented before our demolition and erosion control plan in the front of the library will be the same but at the back um we will we have some changes so we'll walk you through those um so instead of instead of um reclaiming the granite veneer from the existing site wall um the contractor will be removing that from from their scope it, it kind of blows our mind that it is more expensive to salvage material and reuse for a project at this point in our construction industry than it is to um, than to demolish it and get rid of it and then bring something new in. Um, we are going. The other other change on this sheet is um, we're re reducing the scope. So before we had anticipated digging up all the asphalt in the fire department parking lot. Um, and we anticipated replacing some of the catch basins and all of the drainage structure that's for the fire department building and for this project. We were able to speak with DPW and um, we were able to concentrate our efforts <coughs> only to library specific needs. So we will be um, cutting the asphalt and trench, digging a new trench for the sewer line and for the drainage line. Um, and repaving, um, patching and repairing the asphalt in that area um, at a later date when the fire department area, if it's if it's paved, that's when like the re the repaving would happen. Um, and as I mentioned, we are eliminating the Goshen stone seat um, benches out front. Um, we are retaining the seat walls here, and then. We have a couple steps mm -hmm. and a, a emergency egress for the children's area 
uh, retained, but we've eliminated the children's um, patio area. And again, this is something that we pulled out because it's something that could be added back in mm -hmm. as a separate separate project if needed. Um, in the in the back, again, we we've um, we've updated our stormwater system. So this is a, this is what we had before. In the back, we had much more much more substantial um, utilities within the fire department alley. You can see here that we were proposing new catch basins, new new structures, new piping, new connections. Um, and before we had these are the um, the bridges, their their piers, supports, and then the extent of the subsurface system underneath the rain garden. Um, this is our um, proposed layout again, showing you the extent of the of the paving in the fire department alley, the couple structures that are required, uh, sewer and drainage manholes to make that connection. We will have to repave a section of the concrete along North Pleasant Street. And then we've been able to eliminate um, the Goshen Stone Bench, the, um, the Rain Garden Crossings, and then we've um, eliminated the veneer for the, for the site wall. Um, the, we're gonna keep the grading so that it can, uh, the children's patio could be built in the future. And then this shows the updated grading in the rain garden area. So now we have one, two, three basins with yard drains that connect um, into the overall system. Our, um, our planting planting area updates, we're gonna have to, we're gonna increase the shrubs here just a little bit to make up for the lost bench so it looks uniform. Um, and then at the back, oh, we've simplified the planting significantly. The um, we we don't we now just are going to have a no mow planting mix. Um, and then in the utilities in the front again, we're showing the removal of the subsurface stormwater system. We've been able to eliminate a drain manhole because of that, and some some of the drainage piping. Um, and then, as you can see, this is the new the new system. So we have we don't have any drainage here in the front. And then at the back, um, we've eliminated eliminated the proposed uh, drainage structures in the back. And we've eliminated the rain garden crossings. And the proposed design is much simpler. We we're just we're going to have our drain manhole new drain manhole here and convey the water out to the existing drain system here. And then the sewer line will continue all the way up to the connection on North Pleasant. Um, and so in the subsurface stormwater system, we've expanded it this way towards the library, one more bay, an additional five feet. Um, that plus the, the volume of the grading in the back allows us to meet the stormwater requirements. And then um, we've removed the veneer for the granite uh, face of this this wall in the in the north pat patio entry. So I think that's a summary of the changes. Great. Okay. Questions for Rachel. Uh, I see Christine. And then Pam. Christine? Yeah, I just had a, a question. Where did the bike racks end up, especially in the back? I was just wondering. Um, they're going to stay where they were before. We have um, them in the patio here in this area. Um, and then we also have some in the front um, right here. Yeah. So are there any in the back, near the back door? Or near the back area yes yes we have one two three we have four 
bike racks here in the plaza area. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. So they're, they're the best I want, one. Yeah. I want to know that also for when we look at the lighting. So thank you. Oh, Pam. Thank you. Uh, my question had to do with the front of the building, and I couldn't remember if there was originally a walkway to the the book return that was going to be inserted in the in the facade of the building, and I don't see that, which is great, if that's the case. Yeah. So we um, we haven't changed any of the pathways from the original design. So. We have a fully accessible walkway from Amity Street on, on both ends. Um, there's a book drop here, and then we have a pathway, accessible pathway here. So if the book drop is here, this is fully accessible um, all the way, all the way throughout. Clara. Thanks, Rachel. This is really helpful. And two things. One is I love the purple out front now. It's just really beautiful. The other thing is, you know, you were talking about the patios, uh, the patio space that was removed from the outside the children's area. So what is there? Is it just grass for now? Yes. So they could conceivably go out and play. Still, right. It's just not a patio. So less fewer accidents possibly so it's just grass it's just yeah it's just grass okay okay thank you mm -hmm. all right other questions okay anything else rachel Okay, so um, I just want to make sure now that we're all comfortable with what we've just seen. Uh, this is the time for the committee to, to weigh in if it has any questions or concerns. I will just say for myself, I'm incredibly grateful to FAA and to Rachel and your colleagues. Uh, the images that you showed us, the renderings. Um, it looks like it will be an open field to the library. That's really much appreciated. Sight lines, much appreciated. Uh, ingenuity in some of the materials you're going to use, much appreciated. And similarly, in the, in the landscaping design, uh, it just seems uh, re really, really good. And what I, I particularly like is your sense of the future of the building. So making sure that if we want to add here or add there, that we can still do that. Okay. So um, next. Uh... Yeah, Pam. Yeah, I seem to be the only one asking questions. Um, no, I you're not wanted... the only one asking questions, but, but <laughs> we're happy to have you ask whatever you want. I seem to ask too many. Um, just wanted to confirm that with all of the the material changes within the building, um, the expectation of um, wall removal is as it was previously, there's no reduction in some of the interior walls in the historic building. Is that correct? Tony, Josephine? That's correct. Yes. Same as previous. Okay, anything else? So these these designs will be presented as we go through the permitting process. And we'll be eager, obviously, to hear from our uh, the people on the Historic Commission, the Planning Board and Design Review. Okay, Sharon, uh, you want to say something about the 106 process? Yeah, so... Because the library is part of the downtown historic district, changes to the building are governed by federal rules for historic preservation. Uh, and this is known as the section 106 uh, of the National Historic Preservation Act. And so both our HUD grant and our NEH grant require that we certify we're in compliance with federal law, uh, including section 106. 
So we are in regular contact with our grant officers at both HUD and NEH about the status of our project and uh, all the historic preservation issues. So each of those agencies has a historic preservation officer, and these people are providing guidance on, on the steps we need to take to comply with the law. And they have been very helpful. They've been through this process a million times. Uh, so the Section 106 process also involves the State Historic Preservation Officer. So in that case, that's uh, for us, that's the Mass Historic Commission. And our local historic commission is also involved uh, because they hold the preservation restriction to the building. So FAA is going to be presenting these revised plans with all the VE changes to the Amherst Historical Commission on, on August 1st. Um, and it's interesting to note that one of the VE alternates that they'll be presenting is, is keeping the original windows, uh, which keeps us closer to the historic preservation requirements. Um, and we'll also be saving money in doing that. Uh, the Section 106 regulations, they, they lay out a, a very strict process by which the town and the library will uh, negotiate and execute a, a Section 106 agreement that will detail our efforts to avoid, minimize, and mitigate the adverse effects to the historic fabric of the building. Uh, and this process absolutely includes opportunities for public input. So right now we're, we're in the process of figuring out all the steps, laying out uh, in, in detail uh, how we will proceed so that we can keep moving forward um, and, and sticking to our bid timeline and at the same time staying in compliance so we won't be jeopardizing uh, the HUD and NEH uh, funds. And, and once all of this is, is figured out, um, there will be a formal announcement when, when the process is ready to begin. Um, so that, that's just the update I wanted to share with y'all. Sharon, just thank you very much. Just to be clear, this is, um, uh, who will be taking the lead in this? The town will be taking the lead? Correct. Uh, so this, this process, the town is going to go through this process and the library will participate, but it's the town that's going to have the primary responsibility. Correct. Insofar as you know it, the language of avoid, minimize, and mitigate. Avoid, I think I understand. Minimize, I think I understand. Mitigate, can you say anything at this point about what mitigate means? Yeah, it would be, so for example, uh, this panel of wood uh, will be removed. And so therefore, how can we document the fact that this uh, panel of wood existed? So it can be, uh, you know, through photos and exhibits in the future, you know, it just so happens we have an incredible uh, archivist uh, that will help us uh, with that whole, with that whole process. And insofar as you know it, and you may not, and if you don't, you should just, um, does the 106 process examine, if you will, the whole project so that if there are benefits to the whole project, like handicapped accessibility or something else, uh, does that count in the 106 process or they, they're, they're not going to pay any attention to what might, might be called some benefits that might come from uh, some changes. Yes, correct. So the fact that the building right now is not handicapped accessible, uh, that absolutely plays a role. Um, uh, the fact that we are a public library uh, abs and, and we have certain requirements, certain needs, uh, like, for example, the MBLC requirements to have enough space for people to actually be in the building. Yes, those uh, considerations are absolutely taken into account during this process. And if the Massachusetts Historical Commission, let's say, uh, were to reiterate a finding of an adverse effect, uh, how does that play out in the process? So in instituting this Section 106 process, we are assuming an adverse effect. Uh, we have yet to actually have that determination right. in writing, but uh, we are going to assume that so that we can start the process. But my question is the the adverse effect in and of itself is one factor that will uh, play a role in the 106 process. Meaning a determination that there is an adverse effect isn't 
that's the that's that's the end of it. Oh, correct. Yes, that's, absolutely. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. That's just and, the beginning. Thank you. Any any questions for Sharon about the 106 process? Okay. Seeing oh Pam. Um if if you could describe the the timeline again uh, my my confusion is if we have not done our 106 compliance and um, gotten sign off on all that before the before the bid date um are we are we negligent are we in non-compliance um what what please explain what that timeline means yeah, no, we'll be doing it concurrently. So we'll we'll be doing it over the summer uh, at the same time that that the uh, the drawings will be finished and we'll be going out to bid. So it all it will all happen at the same time. Uh, Pam, if I may just follow on your question, uh, I understood Pam's question, at least my understanding of it somewhat. If the 106 process is not completed by the time that we want to go up for bids, can we still go up for bids? Yes. The The only thing that would prevent us from moving forward would be um, Section 106 process has to have completed by the time we go to sign a contract with a general contractor. Okay. Thank you. Farah. So, Sharon, um, that means it has to be done by November. Right. No, no. Once once the bids come in, there is there is time uh, between, you know, that day when we open bid docs and we see the mm -hmm. what the bids are and actually signing a contract with a general contractor. OK. And uh, it's just it's the library. So you and the town are the trustees part of this 106 process as a, I mean, I know we are involved in terms of discussions, but. Are, I'm presuming there's going to be a committee or something. Are trustees part of that? The the there the trustees, the library, and the town will have a seat at that table. As far as um, actual makeup of that is to be determined. Okay, thank you, Pam. I think my my larger concern was. Um, Will will the 106 process and outcome affect potentially affect the NEH and HUD grants? And I think that's to me needs to be in place before we go to bid. We kind of need to know that we have that money in hand, um, so we we know what our finances are. Uh, no, a as I said, um, we only the 106 has to be done by the time we go to sign a contract with the GC. Okay. Any other questions about 106? Okay, Sharon, thank you very much. That was very, very helpful to hear. Uh, correspondence, I, oh, I'm sorry, Christine. I just, um, on our agenda, um, it had um, lighting on it, and we were given a diagram um, of the modeling, and I had a question on that. Great. Great. You want to ask your question? Sure. I don't know. Um, usually a specialist does that, so I don't know where it came from. And I didn't see where actually the exterior lighting was going to be. But I know that's the drawing that will go or the diagram that will go to the planning board and they will look at walkways and such. And I just noticed um, I had a concern with the area on the back door. It's very well lit. There's a lot of twos, threes. I'm not looking at it, so I'm just trying to remember from my head. Twos, threes, and fours. But then there's a long strip of um, under uh, 1.0 when you get to that the back um, uh, V walkways there. And then it also drops again on the eastern part of the walkway right before the uh, those where those bike um bike storage is going to be and then it drops below one again as you come up the driveway the up the grade next to on the east side of the building and i just know you know in winter we're dark by five and um a lot of people use that as a cut well first of all i security is what i'm thinking by the back door because it does pinch in and i don't want to 
people to feel like they're in the dark at all. And then when um, with the parking lot, uh, the CVS parking lot, and who knows if ever there's a parking garage or something there, people will use that other walkway. The eastern side is a cut through. And I just want to make sure that the numbers are over one. Um, okay. So I don't know who's doing that, but Ra Rachel. Fine. Yeah, I can share. Um, yeah, and this is put together by um, a lighting representative who mm -hmm. has taken feedback. We've had a many, many back and forth updating it. So what I'm going to share with you and what you've seen is a, the old plan with the new fixtures. So we're asking them to update that plan to our current line work. So, you know, taking off the Goshen benches, taking off the rain garden, taking off the planting bed. So it's going to get cleaned up a little bit between now and our next presentation, but I can walk you through that. I'll also say shout out to Jess in our office. Um, we spent a lot of time in the evening hours, in the cold this winter, um, going around with a light meter. We had two different, I used a light meter on my phone, just used a light meter, handheld light meter, um, mm -hmm. and then one on her phone also. And we went around, we walked around downtown Amherst and checking um, foot candle readings. Mm -hmm. And then we also went to a couple new developments in town to compare. And we wanted to make sure that we weren't over illuminating, but also we weren't under illuminating. It was really shocking how low the light levels are in town. A lot of the sidewalk readings were like 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.3. Um, you know, right uh, right across the street, you know, it's point, you know, 0.8 uh, really quickly. So um, it was interesting how how we perceive light in, in sort of a darker downtown environment. Um, some of the newer developments, the the light fixtures are really intently br intense bright. Like we we got a reading of twenty underneath um, a bollard on one University Drive. We got a reading of fifteen, and that's where I think the, the jarring happens. The glare is really hard to adjust your eyes when it's so bright and then it's dark in a very short short space. So um, one of the things that we did ask after that, we did ask the lighting designer to make sure that the lights are dimmable so that if we need to adjust some a fixture on site we can bring it down to tone it down if it's if it feels too bright in the context there um but I'll, I'll go ahead and share that that plan and we can go through it together um, so out front um we do have an existing light fixture um, that the town has provided um, these are the photometrics for that fixture that does provide a, a fair amount of illumination for the crosswalk. Um, and this does jive with what the readings that, that Jess and I took. We got about a you know 1. 1. 1.3 to 1.5 in that area. Um, we also have um, some, some lighting here in the front. We've, because we removed, we did we used to have lighting underneath the benches in the front um, and we've eliminated those. So what we've done is we've gone back um, we requested that they they modify this slightly, but we're going to have three bollards in the front. Um, we're not, I don't just, do you know if, didn't we suggest that that bollard be over, over yeah, here? Yeah, so they're all going to, they're all in the planting bed. We actually received that today. So they're all, they're all in the planting beds spaced evenly. Yeah, so, so we. On both sides. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so we're going to have the bollards in, in the planting beds. Um, let's go see. Uh, so the at the main entry, um, we we do have some wall sconces here on the side. Um, we do have it is a little bit low in this area, um, but again, we, you know we're we're mostly we're mostly in that range. And then we have the walkway, illuminated walkway that hasn't changed from before. We're in the, you know, the ones in the one range. Um, in the back, we've got the um, catenary lighting area that we're a little bit less than one in some, some areas, but we're also going to have some glow from the building coming out. And that was one thing that was interesting in our walking around with the site. Um, there are areas, whenever there was a window adjacent, it felt brighter than what the foot candle reading was. So whenever you have lights on when 
uh, in a building adjacent to an area where you're outside, it feels brighter, even if the foot candle reading is lower. Um, and then we have the, the walkways out. We have a, a new fixture proposed along this walkway. Uh, we have a new fixture proposed here. The foot candles in this area are over one. Um, the plaza area, we are got a little bit of more under canopy lighting underneath this little overhang on the building. Um, so most of the most of the plaza ranges from looks like from three to three to one with a little bit of a dip here to point eight. Um, we have we have a a, a site light here, full mounted light here. Um, and then we have a second, that second one here. So again, our, our light, our photometrics here are above one, a little bit of a hot spot um, underneath that, that light fixture. And then as we come around the building, we're over one on this side. We do have canopy, a canopy downline on the building and some wall sconces here. And then as we come up the walkway, um, we have another pole mounted light that's fairly bright with a, with six is the photometric foot candle. And then we're, we're looks like we're mostly above one with, with a dip down to 0. 0.5 in the parking lot area. Um, And then we're back to you know you, what's existing on site in front of the sidewalk there, point three point closer to that with point three point five. Christine. Yeah, I still have a few areas of concern, like right where you whoops, where you were there. Um okay. you said a dip of point five, but actually to the left, there's a point three, and in front of that another point three on the walkway. And um again, we've got foliage and bushes on either side. So Point three, I'm thinking um, we have that book drop by the front door, and that was another very low area in front of the front door. Um, you know, I'm seeing people in the in the winter or in evenings going up to drop the box, and I mean it's down to point two, point four, point two. At least on the on the right side where the book drop would be, that might want to be but next to the right of the front door. That might be a, a little brighter. Um, I'm just thinking of process where people are walking. Why would they be going there in the dark? And, and you know, it we're open on the library is open on on evenings and stuff. Right. So um, on the way back, the back door is my other still concern. Um, it's that where you're walking the long and narrow, like there's the door. Mm -hmm. and it's it's OK by the door. But then as you go back. Mm -hmm. It still drops to 0. 0.3, 0. 0.5. Mm -hmm. I just, you know, especially as a woman, you know, if it's dark at night and where it's a visual pinch and pinches in between the wall and the um, retaining wall, it, I, I just think a little more light there would be a good thing. I, I understand you want balance, but I would want to see it closer to one there. Okay. Okay. Well, Rachel, you'll make those changes. We'll we'll work with FFA and Great. um and the lighting designer to try to get the light more brighter in those areas. Great. Thank so, you. I, I guess the planning board will look at it. That's Great. it. I, I am wondering so the the existing outside on the sidewalk for Jones, that's at like point three. Are you thinking that existing area? Yeah, over there. That's that's kind of like what it is when you do the reading. Is that too dark right there currently? Is that what you're... It, it? If I can speak from formerly many years being on the Public Works Committee um, and having a big concern about crosswalks, that is too dark for the crosswalk. So, it, you know, I know you're trying to match, but in truth, those sidewalks should probably be a little bit more lit up, especially where you're having a mid-block crosswalk, which are already a little more risky than if you're at um, an intersection. So any extra, I wouldn't want to see it dip too low there either, because you'd actually be helping the crosswalk. Yeah. So, so um, to clarify, the crosswalk is here, Yeah. not, not here. I think this no. is a patch from the utility plan but exactly. this is where the crosswalk is it's and a mid block yeah yeah 
and this is the existing fixture there. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't, I don't believe we are propo we're not re proposing to change this fixture. Um, no, but that's why when I looked at the walkways going towards going the to door, I wouldn't want them to be darker. Okay. Okay. Darkness. Maybe, you know, you hopefully get on the sidewalk and then you're looking to where you're walking. And like I said, there's ramps and stick, you know, to get to that drop box up by the front door. Mm -hmm. That's a little okay. dark. Plus security wise, I think it would make people feel a little, right. you know. Okay. Thank you, Christine. Thank, Thank you. you, Rachel. Thank you. Okay, if you could take down the screen share. Thanks so much. So um, no correspondence, no topics not anticipated by the chair. You have an opportunity for public comment. If any member of the public wishes to uh, to speak, if you would raise your hand. And what I want to do is I want to, everybody wants to speak, if you would raise your hand. So we'll figure out how many people want to take advantage of the public comment. Okay, I've got four speakers. I'm going to limit it to the four speakers. Okay, Jeff Jeff Lee. Hi, I'm Jeff Lee from South Amherst. Um, I understand you're saving the millwork now on the existing walls and cutting around it. My question is, in the previous design, there were several walls that were being moved. You're going to reuse millwork on the moved walls. I wonder if that's still the plan. Or is that millwork going to be now discarded? Um, second question was about the Section 106 review. Um, you explained that it's required to have the NEH and HUD release the funds that the project has uh, been awarded. I understand it's also the state funds that Massachusetts has a parallel process that's being rolled into the Section 106. And uh, my concern is why was this not done last fall when we went out to bid uh, in January? Uh, seems like that was a serious oversight. And uh, final question is, I think it's important that you identify the certifying officer for the town that the public can go to with questions. Uh, we haven't heard, heard that person identified yet. So thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, next is uh, Sarah. Hello, thank you very much. I'm Sarah McKee. Um, I was a trust library trustee and president of the board of trustees. And I have a quick question um, for Bob Parrott. You, you said that the general bids were due, what date in August, please? I'm sorry, was I, am I audible? You are audible. Bob, Bob has just come back, Sarah. Just, just. Oh, okay, thank you. Bob, the bid dates are what? Certainly. If you'd like me to respond, um, certainly I will. The August date that I mentioned was the deadline for submitting pre-qualification statements, August 7th. Correct. Uh, that's the first step in the bidding process to come up with a list of contractors. We would then advertise for the bidding process around September 11th with bids to come in approximately six weeks or so after that. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. Next is um, Hedy. Hedy Startup. Hedy? Uh, I think I needed to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, Hetty. It's nice, nice, nice to see you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody, and especially to FAA for for making um, some really substantial adjustments. Um, I realize it's very difficult to do. Um, long, long time ago, I did work in an architect's office. Um, I also realized from the perspective of the building committee that letting go of things is really hard. I've been on that end of the equation as well in the past. Um, <clears throat> I would like Jeff Lee's questions answered 
I'm particularly concerned about what could have, should have happened last year. Um, I think a lot of money could have been saved. And here we are, you know, trying to save money. Um, and it seems like something, there was a disconnect at some point. So I, I, I'd, I'd really like an explanation about that. And my question um, related to tonight is about the the mechanized book return machinery. Um, I wonder, um, um, this is just a general question, whether anybody raised the issue of abandoning that in light of the need for a Lena Jones mm -hmm. demolition mm -hmm. project. And if you could speak to that, because it has some implications for the moving of one whole wall of the 1928. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thanks, Austin. No, thank you. Nice, nice to see you. Uh, Mickey? I think the last person is Mickey Rathburn. There you go. Can you hear me now? Y yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. My family and I have lived in Amherst for 35 years. Um, when my children were little, we spent just countless hours at the Jones Library. Um, it was a very special place to us, and and we uh, really enjoyed the ambience of the library, uh, which was intended by the architects to feel like a sort of large and gracious home. Um, and I feel very strongly that the town uh, should not be uh, cutting costs by removing or negatively impacting the historically significant details of the building. Um, I also have something to say about the Section 106 process. Uh, I am a lawyer and um, I've read <clears throat> through a, a lot of uh, materials on the federal and state websites about Section 106. Um, one of the main guidelines uh, <clears throat> is uh, that the process be started as early as possible as the project is being developed. Um, and that the process should be given sufficient time so that it can be completed uh, in a way that that there can be resolution, uh, you know, before, you know, a lot of things start to happen. I assume that this would, you know, be part of the, you know, that it should be completed well before the bids uh, process is open. Um, if the plans are changed in any way as a result of the Section 106 process, it seems to me that those changes should be reflected in the materials that the, are put out for the bidding process. Um, and I just, I'm not hearing that the town is taking this Section 106 process seriously, but, um, you know, the NEH and, and HUD do take it seriously. And uh, if the town doesn't comply and come up with a, you know, a memorandum of understanding, um, a lot of funding is going to be jeopardized. Thank you, Mickey. So uh, I do want to just ask, um, because I'm, I want to I want to make sure everybody's clear about this. Sharon, can you say a word, please, about the book's order? Yeah, we removed the book's order. Right. And um, we are working with the relevant officials uh, in Washington, uh, trying to work with people at the state level to get the process uh, to where it needs to where it needs to be. So I think we're all in agreement that that's what we want to that's what we want to do. Okay, anything else that we need to? I think we're good. Um, 
So the next uh, thing is a de design review meeting on the, the 22nd of July. Uh, and that will begin the process of going and talking to the various town, uh, the various town committees. Okay, again, I just want to say thank you. I, I appreciated what was said. I want to um, express our gratitude to FAA and to Rachel's um, group for being as responsive, as innovative, as creative um, as you have as you have been. And um, we we look we look forward to our uh, next thing, which will be the design review meeting. Okay. Uh, good night, everybody. This meeting is adjourned. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.